Last night, all the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, If only we had died in Egypt or in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. All right. Galatians chapter 5. Verse 1 only. Paul wrote to the church in Galatia this letter, and in it he said, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Another version says, Do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Don't go back. Everybody say, I'm not going back. That's what I'm talking about. Let's pray. Lord, I need your help again today. Um, your word is beautiful and perfect all by itself. But Father, just standing in this moment between uh, uh, your people and, and you, I pray that you download uh, your words from heaven and that you make this uh, a pure message from your heart to them. May I be right in the center of your word. May I not stray from it because, Lord, your scripture is enough. But I pray, Father, you anoint me to speak. And anoint every hearer in the room to receive uh, a challenge, an instruction, an encouragement. Something, Lord, that will help sustain us to the end, Lord. The end is near. I believe you're coming back soon. And only those who endure to the end will be saved, Lord. So sustain us by your word. And uh, we're going to keep our eyes on you. We give you thanks, Lord. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. amen. You may be seated. Man, thank you for being here today. If I didn't say that already, thank you. <clears throat> there's, this, um, there's this issue we've got in the American prison system. Um, I'm no expert, but I think it's kind of widely known that once a prisoner is released after spending time being incarcerated, there's a high likelihood that that person's going to end up right back in jail. Uh, the term is recidiv... Recid okay, I'm glad y'all know it. Recidivist. Recidivist? Is the D before the V or the V before the D? V's before the D, isn't it? Y'all don't know. Recidivist. All right, so anyway, recidivism. Yeah. It's that weird phenomenon where people are released from prison and without fail, a majority of them coming right back and they're going to end up in jail again. Uh, there was a study done and actually of thousands of convicts that were released and set free from their sentence, 68% over the first three years of being released, end up back in jail. 68% cannot find a new way of life. They end up going back to the same tribe, the same group, the same people, the same activities that lands them right where they were released from, right in jail. There was two things, again, I just read up a little bit. One is the network in the community within the prison system. You can find somebody who was charged with their first felony and they're kind of new to this thing and they're put in a community with hardened criminals. They're right there beside career criminals. They learn their uh, character. They learn their network outside of the system. And before long, this rookie who got in is now a more of a violent and hardened criminal person than he was than when he came in. So when he goes out, he has a hard time breaking free from the mindset and the culture. And there's another uh, word that's kind of not a word, prisonization. And that's when the entire prison life uh, begins to be their, their world. Uh, they're told when to eat, when to get up. They're told what they can do, what they can't do, how much free time they have. Everything is a rigid structure. And when they're released and they get out into the new world, well, let's be honest, after about a decade or two, the world they once knew is not even the same world. It's changed on them. And worse, when they get out, they have all the options and all the freedom. And literally, they cannot cope with having that much uh, uh, I guess, freedom or options. So they end up going and doing the things that will land them back into the world that they know. The bottom line is you can get them out of prison, but it's a tougher deal to get the prison out of them. I find the same thing in ministry and church. This church, any church, I'm sure any pastor could say the same thing, how God can help somebody break free of a bondage only to find out it doesn't take long for them to get right back there in it. What is it about an alcoholic or an addict that boasts of a chip after a year or another chip after two years and they've, they've been clean this long and something derails them? 
a, a trigger, a, a pain in life, and, and they end up right back to where they were. Uh, it could be the same for a porn addict. It could be the same for somebody who has cheated on their spouse and they do it again and the spouse is not going to re- re- reconcile this time. They go back to the very thing that almost killed them the first time. And it can, it can be even not on such a social, uh, uh, a socially deplorable scale. Few of you la- in the last couple of months, you said, I'm going to forgive. I'm not going to hold resentment and bitterness toward my ex or toward my uncle or toward my stepdad. I'm letting that go only to realize it didn't take long for the enemy to try to put the emotions and the memory of what they did to you right back on you. And you're feeling it. You're feeling that bitterness just getting a root in you again. Or you may have said, you know what? I'm not going to wear shame anymore. I I broke free from shame early in this series and I walked out on that. I'm not going to hang my head in shame. And then you know what the enemy does? He reminds you of what you did. He reminds you of how many people you've hurt. And there you feel that weight of shame coming back on you. And it's a different kind of scale, but the bottom line is we're the 68% going back into the very thing God set us free from. So today is a declaration that I want you to make. I'm not going back. I'm not going back to what God liberated me from. Everybody has to have a dogged determination. The enemy's not going to be okay with you just going free from what he had you in. He wants to pull you back in it. So just four encouragement, simple thoughts about you not going back. Number one, you're going to have to make up your mind that circumstances will not dissuade you. Circumstances aren't going to pull you back into it. One of the most mind-boggling verses in the Old Testament, specifically the Pentateuch, is what we read in Numbers 14. A group of Israelites, all of them, they were upset and mad because of their situation, and they said, it would have been better for us to go to be back in Egypt. Why did God bring us back out here to abandon us, neglect us, and we die out here? And then they said, I know, let's have an election. Let's get a leader to take us back. Now, under, to understand the, the horror of that statement, you got to remember where they came from. For 400 years, somebody say 400 years. 400 years, they were in Egyptian bondage. That's long enough to where none of them I don't think anybody was over 400 years old. None of them knew anything except slavery. All they knew was bondage. All they knew was Egypt. All they knew was the idolatry and the pagan lifestyle of the Egyptians. All they knew was the whip across their back. All they knew was working hard for a slave master. They knew bondage and that was it. Then along comes a deliverer named Moses. God anointed him. He stood up, had a backbone to stand up in front of Pharaoh and said, you're going to let God's people go. And then all of a sudden hope began to arise in them. But then the Pharaoh put more on them, put more work, harder work on them. And that's when it just started getting ugly. So God says, I'm going to show them my power. So here comes the 10 plagues, a plague of locusts and a plague of the uh, Nile River turning to blood and a plague of of uh, gnats and the pl- plague of frogs and on and on and on until that 10th one when he struck down the firstborn of every Egyptian household. And at that moment, the power of God was so heavy on Pharaoh, he said, all right, get out of here, go. Then the favor was on God's people that the Egyptians were literally giving money and jewelry to the Israelites to get out of their house and to get out of their land. That's a mighty hand of God delivering them from the bondage of 400 years. They get their back up to a Red Sea because Pharaoh changed his mind just like that. How many knows the devil ain't going to give up that easy? The Pharaoh comes after him right, right with his army. He's chasing them. Their back's against the Red Sea. What are they going to do now? Did God bring us here to be killed at the sea? And then God opened up the Red Sea. Mighty miracle. Wall of water standing on each side. Hundreds of thousands of people walking across on dry ground. Then turn around. Watch this. And God swallows up the army and swallows up everything from their past that was chasing them in the, re- in the Red Sea. Miracle. Come on, somebody. How many would love for God to swallow up everything chasing you? They did a dance. Miriam was singing a song. The girls are whirling and dancing. And they're shouting how good God is. Then they get thirsty and they get a little grumbled about that. But God said, I got that. Strike a rock. A river comes out of a rock. They get hungry. God says, I got that. Don't worry. Manna comes down from heaven. If, are you with me? If there's anything that's obvious, God is for them. God is helping them. 
God got them out of Egypt and he's taking care of them day by day through this journey. We get this. And they're having to learn how to trust. So then they get to the promised land. They're looking at the promised land right across the way. This is why God brought them out. Oh, this is good. I didn't say this in first service. He didn't just bring them out of Egypt to get them out of Egypt. He's not getting them out of something. He's wanting to take them into something. He's trying to get them into a destiny, into a place of prosperity, into a place where he has his people and they have a distinct identity as a distinct different people of all the nations around them. So they're on the press, they're on the on the verge of going into the promised land. Then somebody has a great idea. Let's send 12 people out. Let's send a committee. You know it's a dumb idea when you got to have a committee. That's just that's just church truth right there. Let's get a committee and have them go seek out the land and tell us what they see when they come back. So sure enough, 12 of them go out, 10 of them come back first. The other two are a little slow to the meeting. And 10 came back, and I think it's on the screen. 10 of them came back and said, hey, uh, it is a good land. We explored it, but we want you to also know it's not just a good land that's prosperous. There are giants in them their hills. There are Nephilim people. Nephilim just means giants. They're descendants of Anak. Look at the next verse. And it says, we seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we look the same to them. And at that news, at the news that this isn't going to be easy, at the news we're going to have to fight if we're going to remain free is when they turned and they said, maybe it's not a good idea we're out here. Maybe we should just go back to what we're comfortable with. Maybe I should go back to doing life the way I've always done it. I was able to hide the addiction. Nobody really knew. Maybe I should just go back and I can cope the way I used to cope because I didn't know there was going to be a fight. And what, listen, 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 listen. That's all, folks. Uh, so what they're saying is... It's not worth the fight. They're saying, I would rather go back in bondage and be without God than I would rather go into battle with God. And you're in a bad, poor situation when you'd rather go back to what you were and give up God's presence in your life than to go into the fight and say, I'd rather have God with me in the heat of the battle. And if they're going to go back, here's what they're rejecting. They're rejecting God's power that brought them out. If they're going back, they're, they're wiping their feet like he's a doormat. He broke them out, and they said, we don't want that. They're rejecting his power. They're rejecting his provision. The water from the rock, the manna from the heavens, he's feeding them supernaturally. You know what they kept saying? They said, I think we'd just rather just go back. We had good food back then. Remember the steaks and taters? Remember the vittles and, and the collards? I'd rather go back to Egypt. The food was free there. The reason the food was free is because they weren't. They're remembering all the food, but God says, I don't want you to trust in a slave master for your provision. I want you to trust in me. I want my people to learn to say, give us this day our daily bread. I don't want you to lean on what that was. I want you to lean on me. You see what they're having to do is to learn how to live in freedom instead of in slavery. And at the first sign of resistance, they said, let's just go back. And without fail, this is going to happen. If it hadn't happened in your life already, and there's, we're all from a motley crew of people here. I mean, some of you, like seven out of the nine weeks of freedom smacked you in the face. If that's you, you were a blubbering idiot every week. Raise your hand. You said, that was me. There's only a handful. How many, it was like one or two weeks, you got me. God, you got me one or two weeks. Okay. And how many are just not going to raise your hand no matter what I say? Raise your hand if you're not going to. So why was I doing all that? So what, what happens, we get to that point where we've got us broken us free from something and without fail, the enemy's not going to give up easily. Your car breaks down, you have a flat tire, your kids go crazy, you lose your job, you make a, sta you make a stand. Even if you hadn't even been in freedom, just the fact that some of you are in the room today, you've made a decision, I'm going to turn my life around, I'm going to be in church, and that's why you're here right now. Don't, don't expect this to be easy for you. There may be a little feel good to the environment right here, but I assure you, you are marked. <laughs> the enemy doesn't want you to take this step. He doesn't want you to go forward in your faith. He wants you to go back to where you were. So brace yourself. It's not going to be easy. People are going to mock you, especially if you come to this church. They're going to mock you for being in a Pentecostal church. Get ready for that. They're going to mock you for being too serious about Jesus. Get ready for that. The enemy's going to try to get in your marriage and cause conflict. Get ready for that. 
Just understand it's the enemy trying to make it difficult so you'll have the thought, I was better off going back than going forward. And you have to make up your mind, circumstances will not deter me. The second thing, if you're going to remain free, you can't let people hinder you. God help us. And I'm coaching you to look straight at me. Don't look beside you. Don't look, don't look near to the right or to the left. Look right at me right here. Don't look across the room. Galatians 5.1 kicks in, and, and, and this is what we read in our text. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church of Galatia. He said it was for, for freedom Christ set you free. So remain in that freedom and don't be entangled again in the yoke of bondage. Now to be totally contextually accurate, he's talking about the bondage of religion. Uh, he had to teach grace. And that, could you imagine, the most difficult thing he preached was grace. Because they were so much adherents of the law they learned that they were going to honor God by doing things according to the Old Testament covenant. Dot your I's, cross your T's, better do that not on this day. Can't walk that far on the Sabbath. It's all just check, 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 check. You better be circumcised. If you're not circumcised, even as a grown man, if you're going to come to faith, you got to be circumcised. i would be out right there. I'm just telling you right now. As a grown man, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm going to go. Uh, I'm going to go to another. I'm going to start my own religion. Come on, somebody. Anyway, so check, check, check. So... Paul comes along and he's preaching grace. And he says, none of that's what's going to give uh, pleasure to the Father. The law was something that was to point you to grace. The law of the Old Testament was to make you feel how futile and impossible it is for you to be good enough. The law should make you desperate for the message of grace. And Paul says, you don't get saved because you did something. You get saved because he's done something. And you've put faith in that. That's grace, and they received it in Galatia. But by the time he's writing this letter, he's already got news. They're swinging back to their old ways of the, of the legalistic law. They're trying to circumcise grown men. They're trying to pull back and say, hey, this is what we have to do. And Paul, in verse 7, he kicks it in. He says, you were running so well. Who hindered you? One version says, you were running such a good race. Who cut in on you and kept you from running? I find it very powerful, and it's a powerful point. Often, usually, when people are walking away from their faith, there's a who involved. There's a wrong person in their life involved. Notice it wasn't a something, it was a somebody Paul was after. Give me their name. Give me that name. Tell me where they live. Who cut in on you? Who, draw, who was pulling you back what God brought you out of? Who's trying to pull you into legalism? Get out of it. Who was it? Is it that person you're dating? You thought you were going to win to Jesus? How's that working out? Your new tribe at school? Your new co-workers? Who is it? Because not everybody's happy that you're breaking free. Matter of fact, some people are jealous that you're free. The people you used to shoot up with, the people you used to party with, they're not happy about your Jesus walk at all. Because the very presence of your life declaring you're free and you don't need that junk anymore, convicts their hearts. And they know they're not what they should be. So their number one goal is not to say, oh, you're doing so good, you're so good. That is not their goal. Their goal is to pull you back into the pit and to show you you're no better than they are. When really your message is, I know I'm no better than you are, but I've met somebody who can change a life and who can change a heart and he makes me brand new. That's why I am the way I am but I'm sorry I can't hang out with you like I used to. I got to step aside. I got to get a new tribe. I got to get a new people. That's what God wants to do is create a new people out of the, those he sets free. Somebody was telling me after the last service, he said, here's the way I always heard it. If you're going to change your life, you've got to find a new playground and new playmates. I said, I'm going to use that in the next service. I think I'll do that. There's just that much wisdom in it. But Paul said, who is pulling you back? And you start following the, it doesn't, you, you don't have to go far in numbers to see that people were the problem for the Israelites going into the promised land. Ten people, listen, ten people shut down a whole movement of hundreds of thousands marching forward into the, into the promised land. Ten measly, yellow-bellied, spineless excuses for men. Keep your eyes straight at me. 
And certainly don't elbow your husband if he's standing beside you, right? <laughs> Ten guys came back and said, we can't do it. They're giants in the land. Oh, it's good, but we will we, we get squashed. Ten people. And out of, out of all the people, now watch this, ten people influenced, there, there's different opinions. There's a few hundred thousand of them or a couple million of them at this point. Who cares? I don't have time to argue about it. But those ten people, everybody was convinced by them. So much that they disbelieved God. Here's what God said. All right, you like the wilderness so much? You want Egypt? Here's what you're going to get. If you're 20 years and older, you will not see the promised land. You're going to die in the wilderness. There you go. Happy? That's you. Don't believe me? Don't trust me? You want what you had? All right, you're going to die in the wilderness. Right there you are. Out of all the hundreds of thousands, there were two men, though. Joshua and Caleb, the other two spies, they were late to the party because they were scouting out how good things were, not how bad things were. That'll preach, by the way. And they came back and said, we can do it! God is with us! And by the time their moment and their statement of faith came out, they were being squashed and shut up by everybody. Else. Shut up! There's giants. And Joshua and Caleb said, I'm telling you, we can do it. I know our God is able. We don't need to go back to Egypt. Shut that up. And we don't need to stay here in the wilderness. Let's take it. And nobody went with Joshua and Caleb, but Joshua and Caleb didn't succumb to them either. Two men stood on what God said they could be. Forty years go by. What a journey in the wilderness. Everybody over 20 years old at that point dies in the wilderness. Could you imagine the number of funerals every day for that many people to die in 40 years? Joshua and Caleb, 40 years later, watch what goes down. Joshua is now leading the nation to take them into the promised land. I love that God didn't pick out, pick out a young whippersnapper. He picked out Joshua, who was one of the two in the very beginning that says, we got this. Joshua's going to lead them over. And then Caleb, well, see, I don't know, 80 years old, I think is what he said. He goes up to uh, Joshua and he says, Joshua, you were with me that day when I said I was ready to take the land. You, I stood with, with you and nobody else did. Now here I am, 80 years old. I'm just as strong as I was then and I'm just as determined. I want what God has given me. Now give me this mountain. Joshua and Caleb stood when no one else stood and refused to let anyone else bring them down. And there are people in your life that you're gonna have to deal with yourself. You're gonna have to draw the line you're going to have to say, no, you will not deter me. I'm walking in the freedom God has given me. And you break up with them, you break up with them. Cut them off, cut them off. But there are people that's bent to pull you back down. Then there's a group of people that God will deal with for you. And I love this. Just a couple chapters over. I'm going to hurry through this one. A man named Korah rises up against Moses. This is like number 16. Cor rises up and he says, Moses, who do you think you are? You ain't nobody. And you're acting like you're so holy. All of God's people are holy. And Korah started a mutiny and a rebellion and 250 people came against Moses. So Moses cries out to God and says, what do you want me to do? So Moses finally, under the leadership of God, says, I tell you what, let's all get together. We'll all get our censers and burn incense. And God's going to show up and tell us who's with him. God will make the difference here. And then they all got their censers and their incense and all that stuff ready. And the glory of the God came. Watch this. This is a great day for a pastor. Uh, the glory of God came down and Moses said, hear ye, hear ye. Let it be known. If these jokers right here die of any other natural cause, then I will admit I am not sent by God. But if God does a new thing, ah, uh, Let's say he opens up the earth and swallows every one of them up. If God does that, then you'll know. I'm the man. I mean, I'm, the, I'm God's servant. <laughs> Getting a little Chad in there, right? <laughs> and as he said that, the earth shook. The earth opened up. 250 followers of Korah, all their families go down in the earth, and then the earth swallows them up. Boom! God's like, that's my man. And I've got to be honest, I would be like, you got that right, boy. Who's your daddy? What's my name? You know, I'd be like, Pastor who? Who? You know, I'm... and thus I am not that good of a guy like Moses was. But here's the point. There comes, there's a group of people you've got to deal with yourself. 
I will not let them dissuade me. But then there's a group of people that God will stand up with you and for you, and he'll shut them down. I don't mean, <laughs> I'm not saying the earth will swallow them up, although we may have prayed that a couple times. Come on, somebody. Especially if you're a parent. You're a parent and your kid's been through something. I saw all these uh, young parents with babies perk up. Oh, you better take notes, honey. You know, if you got a youngin that's not a teenager yet, you better take notes. Somebody help me preach that's got some youngins. A lot. Empty nesters, raise your hand. God brought you through, hallelujah. There's sometimes you just have to pray people out of your kids' lives. You can't make it happen. Oh, sure, you can not let them come over to the house. You don't know what they're doing at school. You, they, they say they're going to the movies. You don't know. I got Live 360. Uh, okay. Well, they left their phone at their friend's house, and they're not there, okay? So that's what's going down. They're smarter than ye are. So you have to pray, Lord, I need you to deal with this. I was talking with Dr. Mark Rutland, and uh, he was just talking. We were talking about this very thing. He said, Chad, there have been times I have prayed for the person my child was dating for their breath to stink. For them to go in for a kiss and it would be absolutely repugnant and repulsive. Can you hear Dr. Rutland saying that? I prayed that God would just make them absolutely gross to them. And do you know God ended the relationship? All I did was pray, pray, God, you deal with that. And God moved and did that. So the good news is there's some people you have to put your foot down and say, I'm not going there. And then there's some people that God will step in and say, I've got this one. This one's on me. Don't let people deter you from freedom. This is big for somebody in the room. You're still trying to have freedom and go back to the old tribe and it doesn't work. It never works. Number three, gotta hurry. Number three, if I'm gonna remain in freedom, I've got to burn bridges. Burn, everybody say burn bridges. God called, Gen God called Abraham in Genesis out from the familiar to a new place. He said, Abraham, leave hometown and go to a place I'm sending you. Abraham says, where are we going? And he said, I'll tell you later. Just go. I'll tell you when you get there. He had to go, not look back. His nephew Lot, Lot and his family were in Sodom and Gomorrah. I'll visit this in a minute. They were told to leave Sodom and Gomorrah before judgment fell and not to look back. Elisha was anointed by Elijah simply by throwing his jacket over Elisha. No words. No, you should go and follow me in the ministry. Just the anointing of God hit him. And Elisha was plowing with oxen and a yoke. And immediately he busted up the yoke and he killed the oxen and he sacrificed them. And here's what he was saying. I'm never going to be what I was before the Holy Spirit touched my life. I'm not going back. I'm not putting this in a warehouse for a plan B. I'm going to go all out with God or I'm not going to make it at all. Not going back, not another plan. If he called me, I'm going forward. And you need that dogmatic determination. If this doesn't work, then it's the end of me. But I'm not going back to what I was. Lot and his family and the whole sexual perversion and absolute uh, uh, just wicked society of Sodom and Gomorrah. God had had it. He's about to rain down fire and sulfur. Luckily, he loved Abraham enough to go warn Lot, his nephew. And the angel said, we got to get y'all out of here. We got to get gone. And Lot was, they were so influenced by Sodom, nobody would even believe Lot. Warned. He tried to warn his son-in-laws and they laughed at him. He's like, no, dude, it's coming. The God has had it. Judgment's coming. And I was like, dude, you crazy old man. They would not go with him. Literally, the angels had to grab Lot, his wife, and his daughters and begin to pull them out of the city and said, run for your lives, it's coming. Don't look back. And they were running, and Lot's wife had so much of a love for the city in her, she looked back, and God turned her into a pillar of salt in judgment. And later in the New Testament, hundreds of years later, Luke 17, 32, Jesus has these words, three words. Remember Lot's wife. Don't ever look back to what God brought you out of. There's nothing for you back there. There's nothing for you. Burn the bridges. 
That's, that's, a, that's actually a military term when back in the Roman Empire and, and armies beyond that, they would go into a town as they crossed a bridge. The commander would uh, command that the, the bridge be burnt behind them because they knew when the battle would get hot, there'd be some coward that would try to run back and retreat. And when they burned the bridges, they were basically saying, there is no retreat. We either beat this thing, we either overtake the city, or we die here. But we ain't going back and we ain't running. How about that for grammar? We're not going back. We're burning bridges. We're losing phone numbers. We're deleting apps. We're blocking people from contacting us. We're changing jobs. We're changing gyms. We're changing grocery stores. Oh, y'all liking this? Okay. Uh, you know, you ain't going to amen me. It just makes me go harder. I don't care. I'll just get on deeper in it. You know what I'm saying? We change the way we go home. We don't drive by the liquor store anymore. We're getting serious, serious about this. If you realize the end game that Satan has for your life, you would change whatever you would have to change so that you could stay free from what God delivered you from. It cheapens the power of God for God to pull you out of what you were in and for you to act like he didn't do it, to act like it wasn't important enough for you to shift a little bit your little habits, shift your driving pattern, shift your friend group. What a spit in the face of God's grace. If God delivered you with his mighty hand, then you should have the gumption to say, all right, she's gone, he's gone, that group's gone, that app's gone, I'm going home a different, I'm changing the way I live so I can stay free. He set me free, but I'm going to learn how to live free so that I'm not a 68 percenter going to be back in it in three years. See, my heart beating, my bird, I, I'm, so, I'm getting a little fired up. My heart beating, my burden is I see it all the time. Jesus said in one of, his, uh, one of his parables, he said, the seed of God goes out and is thrown on the ground and this kind of ground does this, this kind of ground does this. And one of the types is the shallow ground. And the seed of the word of God hits the shallow ground and as soon as it receives it, boop, it spurts up and there's fruit and there's, there's green life and it loves it. But as soon as the sun scorches comes down, as soon as the heat of the sun comes, it withers and dies. Why? Because it did not have roots. It was a surface, feel-good faith. It was I come in and I got the guilt off of me for a few months, but I didn't get changed in my gut. My heart didn't shift and transform. And if I've seen it once, I've seen it a hundred times. People come, I love this church. God has changed my life. Only to three months later, three years later, they're gone. Not moved in another town, not going to another church, just gone. Because they didn't burn bridges. They didn't change the playground. They didn't have the discipline it takes to live free. Burn bridges. I'm talking to somebody right here by the Spirit. You are teetering on the edge of your life being in a ditch. I've lived it. I lived a life of compromise and I tried to tightrope that sucker and live both ways, you will end up in a gutter. Your junk will come out. Why am I doing this? I'm trying to help somebody. This was not... The enemy comes to steal, kill, destroy. He is not playing games. I am your rescuer today, says the Lord. My hand is reached and is reaching. Do not turn me away. I am your salvation. I am your deliverer. Behold, I am your only way out. Says the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, I don't know if you want to applaud that or not. Lord, rescue us. The band can come out. 
or a person can come out. When the Israelites, if that spoke to you, by the way, oh, I'm sorry, that may have been really weird to some of you. Keep forgetting we have new people every week. Um, we believe the Holy Spirit can still speak through gifts of the Spirit today. That could be a prophetic utterance in English. Somebody pulls you aside after service and says, I feel like the Lord's given me a word for you. And it could, that seems real normal. Uh, but when this setting right here, the message in another language alerts everybody that God's wanting to say something that wasn't uh, able to be said except for divine inspiration. And I didn't know what that was said, but I felt the interpretation of what God was saying. And without doubt, it spoke to somebody in the room. I'm feeling like maybe a dozen people in the room. That's what that was. So breathe. We're good. The Israelites uh, forgot one thing when they wanted to go back. <clears throat> when they said, let's go back to Egypt, they forgot what was behind them. If they were to turn around behind them, they would realize there's an ocean that was saying, not today. They came through a Red Sea with miraculous power. God ain't opening it back up for them to go back. There's a Red Sea of grace that says, I was bringing you through that. The miracle just wasn't the waters parting. The miracle was I was changing your identity. I was changing you from being a slave to being a son or a daughter. And my sons and daughters don't go back to slavery. Uh, there's this first Corinthians verse right quick. 10, first Corinthians 10, I think. <clears throat> Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and they all passed through the sea. Watch the wording here. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Three baptisms. Most people only celebrate a, one or two. They get saved, they're baptized in the body of Christ. They get baptized in water for saying, look at what God did for me, and they stop right there. But right here is a distinct three baptisms. When they went to the Red Sea, they were baptized into Moses because Moses said, kill the lamb, put the blood on the doorpost, and the blood will bring redemption and the death angel will pass over you. Baptism in blood means you're delivered from sin. How many saved say amen? You're baptized in the blood. You're baptized in Moses. But then they went in the sea. They were baptized in the water. Just like you were went in baptism in water, telling the world, I'm no longer who I used to be. I'm changed. I'm no longer a slave. I'm a son. I went through the sea that he brought me through. And then they said, but you were also baptized in the cloud. Somebody don't believe in the fullness of the Holy Ghost needs to go study that one because the Spirit of God was leading them in front. The cloud was going before them. When Pharaoh's army was coming behind them, the Bible says the glory cloud turned and it went through the whole multitude and stood behind them and threw confusion into the enemy army, showing that the Holy Spirit goes before us, but then he surrounds us and he stands as our rear guard saying that the enemy chasing us will not catch us. That's a baptism in the Holy Spirit. If Israel wanted to go back, they should have done it before they crossed the Red Sea. If you wanted to go back, you should have done it before you got under the blood, the fountain that washes you clean. You've been baptized. You're a new creature in Christ. God's got his hand on you up there, young lady. Let's see what the Lord may want to do today. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. We hope that the message was a blessing to you and an encouragement to you. If it was, we'd just like to take a few more seconds of your time and ask you to do a few things. First of all, if you don't mind, there's a digital connection card that you could submit and, and, and send our way 
and it'll let us stay connected to you more personally. First, it'll let you let us know who you are. Second, how frequent, frequently you tune in. And also, there's a place for prayer requests, and we would love to partner with you and pray about what's going on in your life. The second thing that would be great is if you could just take a moment, click a link, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. That way, you can stay connected with what's going on at The Point every week. And also, man, if this was a blessing to you today, it might be an encouragement and a blessing to somebody in your friend group or in your network of influence. So why don't you just share this video and pray that God uses it to encourage them as well. Finally, if uh, you'd like to consider blessing this ministry financially, there's a giving link at the bottom. You can click down there and that'll help us continue to throw out videos like this that could be a life changer for somebody out there. So guys, thank you again for joining us. We're so blessed that you did. We're so honored to have you as a part of our online family. And we want you to know one more thing. We love you so much and we can't wait to see you next time.